Hi, Betsy. So let's start with you. Um, you're joining us from your farm, I take it. Uh, tell us what's happening uh, in your neck of the woods and how long your family has been farming and what type of farm animals you raise. Greetings, folks. Uh, my name's Betsy Bullard. Uh, my family and I farm in the town of Turner. Uh, Breguin Farms has been in existence since uh, 1777, as far as we can tell. So my husband and I are the 10th generation to farm uh, pretty much the same site in Turner. We, right at this moment, I am watching the rainfall, which is lovely after the dry start that we had to the summer. Uh, we are dairy. Uh, we have approximately 500 cows that we milk. And a couple of years ago, we decided to be brave and get into the wonderful world of ice cream because who who doesn't love ice cream? So that's been a, a pretty fascinating add-on activity to the dairy. Great, thanks. And uh, let's meet Kina, who, um, and I should mention to our listeners, coincidentally, all these farms happen to be located in Androscoggin, so uh, county. So we'll get into that kind of history of that farming community uh, later on. But Kina, uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little more about your farm. Hi, my name is Keena Tracy. I run Little Ridge Farm in Lisbon Falls. We are mostly a vegetable farm with a CSA, but we also raise turkeys and pigs and beef cows and sell them uh, bulk as a part of a CSA too. So either buy the half or the whole. And yes, I... I, like Betsy, am very excited to see some rain. Um, it allows the not only my vegetable crops to grow, but we rotate the animals throughout the fields. So it's nice to have green pastures again, and the animals are way happier and, and cooler. And the pigs, especially, they like having a big puddle to swim in. So they're happy too. Great. Well, perfect timing. And um, our next uh, farm is Old Crow Ranch. Uh, Saren, she's actually cooking up some delicious uh, local foods, I believe, this evening in her kitchen. So welcome, Saren. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and your family if you'd like. I'm Saren Tanisi here at Old Crow Ranch. Steve just walked in finishing up chores. Um, I've got my AirPods in so he's not going to be able to hear anything. Thank you, Sonia, unfortunately, as neither are my small girls who are wrestling over on the couch. Um, I am cooking up some chicken breasts for dinner. Um, we are a pasture-based uh, livestock farm here in Durham. We raise uh, chicken, pork, and beef. And we sell it out of our farm store and we sell it wholesale to Farmer State Market, which is a butcher shop up in Wales. Um, and we sell it directly to customers who want to buy it, similar to what Kina does. Um, our main products are the livestock, and he has a bit of a farming problem, so we also have abundant gardens. So most of every meal we make here, I'd say 80% on average, is produced right here on farm, which is top notch. And because I've got 100 girls, I'm going to keep cooking while we chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And feel free to uh, introduce them to our listeners as needed. Um, so I, I want to go back to this uh, concept that, Kina, you mentioned. Um, so I heard the word um, bulk and um, CSA. So those are a couple like words that maybe our listeners might not be familiar with. And, and we'll kind of begin this conversation, I guess, talking about how people can buy your farm products. And then we'll go like work, I would like to say, like work behind, you know, beginning with the end in mind. And for most of us, the end is buying something at the supermarket or a farm stand, or in your case, a CSA, right? So, so tell us a little bit more about what what is a CSA and what does it mean to like buy meat in bulk? So a CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And it is a way for the farmer to know how much food to raise. So for me, I, I know how many customers I'm going to have in advance. So I can figure out about how many animals I need to raise or how much vegetables I need to raise. 
Um, and they also pay either in advance or a deposit in advance. So that allows me to purchase um, any sort of supply that would go into uh, growing that animal, which could be buying the piglet, for example, or the calf or the little baby turkey um, and grain. It could go into buying supplies for their for their housing, for their feeding. And it allows us as a farmer to not go into as much debt. So it so in return, then we're giving you a price that is paying for our labor and our supplies, but it's not paying for overhead and debt. So it can help keep that price down a little bit. And then by also by buying it in a larger quantity, for you, the customer, the price is generally smaller than if you're buying it specifically by the piece, cuts by the piece. So for example, in, in a beef cow, you know, steaks generally are way more expensive than hamburger. But when you buy a, a side of a beef, it ends up averaging out. And so you're paying the same price for the steak and hamburger. So not only are you getting a better deal, but you're getting you're getting meat that is way healthier for you and the environment. And it also is just, it tastes way better and is, um, and is fresher too. So we do sell our product um, mostly through the CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture. We do have an online store now that we have some cuts that are for sale by the piece, but mostly it's just hamburger because the, you know, an animal only has so many steaks. <laughs> so there's seems to be a lot of ground beef. The pork, I always sell out. So I, I've never sold those by the piece. Um, I only have enough land to support 14 pigs. So, so those we only sell through the CSA. And if someone's, um, like buying something, so you mentioned by the piece. And so the unit price is, um, a little bit more and for your scale that works perfectly for your business model um and do they get it all at once as part of the csa or should they have like um i've heard some folks say we might want to have a freezer chest you know it's really more of an a longer term investment too to keep that quality where you want it to be so any tips for your customers that way well, we're really lucky the the butcher, the processors in Maine are are conscious of, you know, they do a really good job. So they package the products really well. So where we get ours processed, everything comes vacuum sealed in a in a package and it has the label on the front. So that vacuum seal versus the old fashioned butcher paper, actually, it, it prevents freezer burn and it allows meats to be kept longer than what they used to be. Um, and, but yes, you would need a freezer, um, like a half a pig or a quarter cow is about four cubic square feet, which is the size of a regular freezer on a refrigerator. So it's not a huge amount of space. And trust me, once you get a small freezer, you'll be happy to fill it with frozen berries and other main frozen vegetables. So your meat won't be lonely in that chest freezer. <laughs> The meat won't be lonely. That's a good, um, probably a segue to to you, Betsy, in terms of how to keep your refrigerator um, and freezer items not lonely. You mentioned that your family has been farming for generations and you are actually coming to us from your ice cream shop right now. So um, not going to keep you lonely if you um, would like ice cream uh, for your freezer meats or frozen berries. Tell us a little bit more about if somebody wants to buy um, your farm products, do they do it only at the ice cream shop? And um, what else are your cows providing for food products? I think Keenan has a great point. You should always be concerned about your items in the freezer being lonely. So you definitely want a variety of items. And, and certainly as we continue with the making frozen custard and making that available. We, we want to help folks out with that. For the last however many tens of years, our farm produced milk uh, 
exclusively for wholesale purposes and the vast majority of it went to to fluid milk and was processed here in the state of Maine. So if you were if you were grabbing a gallon of milk or you were grabbing a pint of milk to to drink on the road, you were probably chances were decent that you may have had some of our milk. And that's still the case for the vast majority of our milk. It is processed in state. We're members of uh, DFA, Dairy Farmers of America Cooperative. But the, like I said, that milk is processed and, and most likely will show up as, as fluid milk. So throw it on your cereal and enjoy that way. We, when we began with the frozen custard, we had visions of scooping uh, pretty exclusively. That was how we were gonna connect connect our product with the consumer, but clearly uh, we had a little pandemic that had <clears throat> some other uh, opportunities open up for us. So we also uh, have the ability to sell online and folks can, you know, if you have a hankering for custard in the middle of the night and you want to place your order then, that's fine. We can have it out in the freezer for you the next morning for uh, easy pickup on the way by. Uh, we do scoop a couple days a week, Saturday and Sunday as well. And we've also added a just kind of if you are in the neighborhood and you stop by, there's a cash box and kind of the honor system that way, as well as some other local farms that have farm stands that are pretty booming this summer. I would say we've been fortunate to have have some synergies develop there and some with some other local farms. We're pretty we're pretty excited to see that happen. Right. And, um, you know, not to clearly Saren, she's in the middle of showing us how to not keep um, your fridge or your family or your or your tummies lonely um, this time. So um, we, we've talked about um, beginning with the end of mine. And so for those of you who aren't watching live or maybe you're listening later, uh, Saren has been making supper, or it's what we call it here in Maine. And uh, she's been using a lot of local ingredients and um, you raise a uh, beef and do you also do pork and do you do chickens as well Saren? Yes we do uh, 1200 broilers and uh, like 175 hogs and 70 head of cattle um, so livestock again meat is where it's at for Old Crow Ranch um, and I'm cooking up some of our chicken breasts which we sell whole but Steve being um Master Butcher, among one of his many other hats, uh, breaks down about 17 for our freezer. Our freezers are not lonely. We have many, many, many of them um, in our farm store, in our shed, for our own use, for sale, <laughs> all of the things. Um, I'm loving what you're, what I'm hearing from the other farms. And Betsy, I want to create some synergies with our farm store and custard. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, eating eating close to home is so where it's at. I mean, for us, as farming, you don't have, it's not a high income business, so to speak, but it is a high nutrition business. We eat what we have, and we are so, so fortunate in that what we have is so nutrient dense. It like, it just couldn't be a better way to uh, nourish our bodies. So um, we feel fortunate to be able to eat this way and to be able to share it with our community so they too can um, relish this good food. And That's their great. Freezers. How long does it, did it take, so not just talking about cooking this chicken and you know thawing it out, but how long did it take, um, you know, cause we're gonna walk backwards and say, okay, it's supper time. Um, but how long does it take for, like, when do you start planning? Like to raise these broilers, they take a lot of care. Um, what goes into that? The broilers certainly take a lot of care. We start planning over the winter to know when our, um, when our chicks will come. And as soon as you know when your chicks will come, you need to know when and where they're getting processed. Processed is a, um, a PC way of saying slaughtered, <laughs> one of those uh, dangerous words. And um, if you don't have those dates in hand when you get your animals on farm, which a lot of um, hobby or amateurs don't know about, you can be up a creek with a lot of animals at the end of the game. Um, even Yeah, even with pigs, as Steve's chiming in, um, if we... Uh, have more than booked we before they're born. booked before they're born, booked a year ahead, a year in advance for sure. Um, so we set our calendar for chickens and hogs and talk to our markets. And just like uh, Kino was saying with the CSA system, I open up 
ordering for our direct sale customers so I know what I have to sell. And right now our CSA is sold out for 2021 because I have a certain amount, amount allotted for that. And they're, they're on the ground already. It's a long enough time period the animals are raised for and or a short enough growing season. Hogs, we're a feeder operation. So hogs are with us for five months. Um, we get them as piglets and we raise them up. And at that rate, there's only so many we can grow. So, and beef take 24 months. So the grass fed beef takes 24 months to minimum. get to minimum. Ours are more like 26 or 27 yeah. months on average. Um, our broiler chickens are a an 11 week bird, which is pretty quick, not nearly as quick as the white ones, but the Freedom Rangers, we get a nice size five pound bird at 11 weeks. And we don't wanna raise them in the winter time. So we're taking them into as late a fall as we can and then saying, all right, that's what we get. Freezer, freezer camp it is, <laughs> go on off. Um, <laughs> I like that term freezer camp because yeah. it helps us understand, okay, this is where we're, um, well, it, it brings reality to the food we eat. Um, you mentioned a couple things uh, for our listeners and viewers who, who don't know. So um, so when you say the white worms and the freedom rangers, you're talking about the, the breed of bird, right? I'm talking about the variety of bird, yeah. Um, so the white ones are a Cornish cross. They're a fast growing meat bird. We as humankind have done some crazy things to make, um, well, everything, vegetables, animals, to the best profit of our, of our, of our farming endeavors, eating in endeavors. And so the white ones grow obnoxiously fast, like five to six 60, weeks. Yeah, 60 weeks. Um, depending on how you farm them and, and how you raise them. And they also are very easy to process because they've got all those white feathers that you can't see. We grow the red ones. The butcher shop sometimes hates us, but uh, we find their meat to be much um, more of an even growth. It's not all about the giant breasts because breast meat is not really where it's at in my life. I'm th thighs all the way. Give me the, give me the dark meat. Um, so the Freedom Ranger has a more even confirmation of... Um, white meat to dark meat and yeah but there's trade-offs they're really good foragers that's awesome um they eat a lot of bugs out there crickets on the pasture right now. crickets right now so yeah that's great uh, kina you raise a little bit of um the same species right so you're raising um you're raising pork or which comes from pigs and you're raising uh, you talked about the beef and you do poultry as well do you do um meat birds or are you also doing um eggs or, or other protein products i actually just do turkey for as far as poultry goes um i buy in eggs and chicken from other farms to resell um yeah for my it's almost too, it's too fast. Like the, the chicken process is too quick. It's, it's better for me and the layout of my farm. So the turkeys I get the first week of July and they get processed in like about the second week of October. Um, definitely some customers get a little frustrated that they're getting a whole bird in October rather than November, right before Thanksgiving. But the reality is because my animals are pasture raised and they're not raised in a barn, the weather gets pretty nasty in November. It gets cold and icy and rainy and their water's frozen every morning. And they're taking their the grain, which they're consuming on top of the, the forage that they're consuming in the pasture. And they're using that to keep their body warm rather than to put on weight. So basically I'm spending money on, on food and labor for them to just keep warm. <laughs> so by processing them by the second week of October, it's just before the weather gets really cold and it's just before the grass really starts to die off and not, not have as much new growth and nutrition. So, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's why I do that. Um, 
And and it's tricky sometimes to explain that. People have it in their head, oh, then a, a frozen bird isn't as good as a fresh bird. But when the bird is that fresh and that's only in your freezer for a short amount of time, it's it's amazing. It's really, really good. So. And there's a lot of care and effort that goes into uh, taking care of them. You've mentioned that. Um, yeah. What? So you source them from another farm, and then how long does it take to, um, you know, like, in a day to like care for the animal, and then walk us through that, you know, from from when you get the birds, and you know how you raise a healthy healthy turkey. Yeah. So the the turkeys come. I buy them actually from a, a hatchery in Ohio and they come in the mail and they come as by the time I get them, they're two, maybe three days old. And they, they turkeys have basically zero immune system. Chickens have a bit more, but turkeys have zero. So when I first get them, a, they need water right away and B they need warmth. So by by getting them in July versus earlier is also good because the air temperature is just warmer because they want to be kept at 95 degrees for a couple weeks. And then beyond that, they still need heat, heat lamps to stay warm. So I, I take them out of their little box and introduce them to the water and to their space. And this space is a very secure space, non-drafty space protected from predators in my barn. Um, they stay pretty closed up for the first two to three weeks with the heat lamps. Um, they have access to water and food at all times. And, and then as they get uh, older, so my barn door opens up. So I have screen on the door. So now, right now they're watching the sunset, although they're watching the rainfall right now. Um, so at this point, though, they are about a month old. And here next week, I'll take that screen down and allow them to go outside and forage. And then at night, they'll go back down to my barn. Um, once they get a little bit older, and just not quite so small for basically for overhead predators to get, I will put them outside. They're in an electro net and they have, um, it's basically, it's a carport that I put on wheels. And so that's their shade mobile. And we have, um, yeah, they just have free range in within their space. And every two to three days, then I move them to a new spot. So they have fresh ground. Turkeys poop a lot. So, and they eat a lot. So um, you want to give them nice, fresh ground. Um, that way it just, it makes it nicer for them and for us when we go in to, to care for them. They're pretty fun to move. They imprint on me. They basically think I'm their mom. So at this point now, when I, when I move them out in the field, I can just take the fence down and they wander around a little bit and kind of explore. But then as soon as I call, I have their new spot ready to go i call them and they come they come right back and go into their new spot they're pretty excited for new grass do you use a turkey collar um like <laughs> you know <laughs> i don't they just know my voice they just know my voice and yeah. i don't i don't know as much about chickens so maybe they do it too but the turkeys they have different calls or chirps and so there's the distress chirp there's the uh, I'm out of food or out of water chirp, or there's the happy chirp. And the happy chirp is really fun when they go into new pasture. They like do their little happy chirp. That's excellent. And so I love how you've described, you know, just the level of detail that you know about your animals and the attention to detail that goes in like every single day of their life. We've heard a lot about what it takes for managing poultry. Um, you know, Betsy, I'm going to turn it over to you because um, unlike unlike poultry, cows are a little bit different. They um, Their bodies are actually very different as well. So um, what goes into the care and health of managing cows? Do you, are, you, are you buying baby calves um, from a processor um, and having to heat them up, you know, like you do poultry? 
we probably all know the answer to that. But um, for those of us who don't, uh, tell us what it's like for a, a calf to go from being a calf uh, to producing milk for your uh, custard. They, they definitely do not arrive in the mail. Although, although like when I'm, when I'm thinking today about, about mating decisions for say, I want to have custard or I want to have milk with certain characteristics. Like I'd like to have milk with higher butter fat content or a higher protein content. So I'm deciding today what the mother cows, how we're, you know, doing the dating search for them and uh, trying to decide what the best matchup is to make sure that two years from now, three years from now, you know, three years from now, by the time they are pregnant for nine months, the calf calf is out, everything's successful in that, in that regard. You raise the animal for two years. She in turn has another calf and begins producing milk. So that's a, that's a pretty long track to, to head down, but I'm making those decisions today for Quite a long ways down the road and i like the idea that each of us saren and kina and i are all lending a little bit more detail to what goes what goes into the work before it ends up in your fridge or it ends up on your table or, or in your belly because it's not very similar to i need to make a snap decision at the drive-through window sort of thing that that minimizes tremendously for the average consumer what the actual time that goes into creating those things that that may come in a bag or in a you know in a clamshell uh, carrier to be enjoyed on the drive home or or to be enjoyed at your table at home but as far as the day-to-day -day care uh, fortunately you had a picture of one of my cows up in the beginning uh clip and you could see that she had some pretty cool jewelry on and since a lot of our work is based on preventative kind of things and trying to understand better what uh what's going on pretty much all the time with our animals and and we're not necessarily close enough to to hear those different kind of chirps and cows mostly have chirps that involve feed me now or continue feeding me, or maybe you could feed me again. Uh, all of our cows have something that's pretty, the technology is pretty much like a Fitbit. So we're, we're watching their activity all the time to see if today's activity is different from last Tuesday's activity, or if it's different from the month before, do they feel okay? Uh, do, actually, do they feel better today than they did last month? And are we feeding them something di different? Or is it, do they feel better today because it's 70 degrees and a little rainy versus last week where it was 95 and humid. And, and the answer to that is, yeah, absolutely. They, they're loving today and 95 and humid isn't so much fun. So a lot of our work is around supporting these guys and making sure that we have enough information to make the best decisions for their daily care and keeping them cool and cool and comfy and fed because they're pretty persistent about that. <laughs> They, they like the food. Um, so how do you know that they're feeling good about this? Like, are, what's the data telling you and, and where do you get it? Is it something that comes just, to, do you get an email to you? Just, I mean, obviously the cows can't talk. They don't have thumbs. They can't type this out to you. So what's stored in that Fitbit uh, jewelry for cows? Yeah, so that, I can access that in a number of different ways. It's either like everything, there's an app for it. So I have an app on my phone so I can check uh, overall information. And there's also, I have a desktop at the dairy where I have information that contains that Fitbit information as well as each animal's entire, think of going to the doctors and that whole file that your doctor has on all, how much you weighed when you were born, when you had all your immunizations and any other health concerns or anything else that happened with you. Our cows have the same thing on the computer and cows like to be bored. Like their favorite thing is to be bored. If they can do the exact same thing at the exact same time every day, they are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. Say it's daylight savings time or something like that. Thrilled is not the word that comes to mind. They have a different sort of noise that they make that day. And generally it's around why is this different? What have I done to make you not as happy with me that you would cause my schedule to be different? 
So you can officially debunk that myth um, that farmers created daylight savings. Is that what I'm hearing, Betsy? I if if farmers did create it, I feel like their club membership is at serious risk. <laughs> I think Saren would agree. Um, Saren, give us a little update on how supper is going. You you gave a little nod as well, um, and so I just want to pause to have you chime in on on that. Um, Daylight savings, interruptions to daily schedules. Um. Daylight savings is so bunk. <laughs> um, who thought that was a good idea? Um, yeah, the, it's, I get to hear the rants yearly. Um, Steve and I have a pretty 1950s division of labor here on the farm. He does everything food related and outside. I do everything food related and inside, not everything. He helps me with the food preservation, which is top notch. Um, but, uh, and I, do all the marketing and sales and whatever, what have you. And, but he does all the animal care. But the day in the life, I love the routine. And he's adamant. He's like, no, it's got to be, they've got to be, the pigs have got to be fed 12 hours apart. And I'm like, that doesn't happen in the winter. Why does it have to happen in the summer? He's like, so I can get a full day of work in between chores. Okay. We love these 18 hour days. Who needs sleep? <laughs> but I know you guys can relate. Um, so uh, regularity is is key in, um, in both the animals' lives and in Farmer Stevo's. And as he keeps keeps a very um, meticulous schedule for um, the feeding of the animals and the regu regulation of the farm of uh, what gets planted when. The last green beans, he realized he didn't have any seed, but it was on the schedule to be seeded. So. We don't have the last planting of green beans, but it's not the end of the world because we've already put by a lot of green beans. So, <laughs> so, um, so it kind of sounds like good for you know routine is good for animals. It's good for um, the farmers as business people, and um, I guess I would also kind of think about like bigger picture uh, for our listeners who are just joining or might be listening later. Um, we've been talking a lot about like a day in the life in general, and we're happy to discuss like this is what's happening during summertime. But what does a winter routine and Betsy, I'm going to go back to you. What does a winter routine look like for a group of 500 cows uh, growing up in Turner, Maine? Uh, the routine for the cows doesn't look any different in the winter than it does during the summer. In the summer, we do a lot of work around cooling. All that means is we have a bunch of fans because cows are not terribly, terribly efficient coolers on their own. In the winter time, uh, we do our best as the supporting cast for the cows to make sure that any of the extremes of the weather that that they're protected from those. Cows are actually happier with cold weather than they are with hot weather. They don't they don't love hot weather. They don't they don't cool themselves particularly efficiently. So a 30, 40, 50 degree day is a lot more fun from them for them than a 90, 95 or 100 degree day. Um, but they still like to be bored even in the winter time. So whatever we need to do, whether it's some extra hours of plowing or whether it's some extra making sure a generator's hooked up someplace, if there's any interruption in power, those are the biggest things that we can do in cold weather to make sure that those guys have the exact same thing going on every day. So let's touch base on that backup power system because the routine is part of what keeps the cows happy and healthy. And then in turn, you know, as we've heard a nice well-stocked freezer or, or fridge, um, backup power, like, Simple question, if I've never been to a farm, why do we even need backup power on a dairy? Yeah, because all pretty much everything we do is dependent on electricity from the pumps on the wells that provide the water to the cows, to the lights that come on to make sure that everybody's operating in a safe and uh, predictable sort of manner, nobody likes surprises in the dark, to all the machinery that ensures that the cows are milked in a consistent and sanitary kind of way. So it's it's a big it's a big deal. When the ice storm was, however many years ago that was, uh, there was definitely lots of generators that moved across the countryside to ensure that 
both animals and people were cared for. And then that end product was stored in a manner that maintained the safety and, and uh, eatability of that, those end products as well. And so for our listeners who didn't know what this ice storm is that we're talking about, it happened in 1998. And I've actually heard from a lot of farmers that, you know, moments like that are what really kind of show a testament to the value of farming. So we've just interviewed a handful of farmers over the past three episodes, but community really plays a role in that. So I think it was really fascinating to hear. If you ever go to like the Ag Trade Show, you'll hear farmers talk about, oh, well, such and such an event happened, Um, such and such a need existed, but they really all come together. Uh, Have you experienced any other kind of senses of building community within agriculture? I mean, your family's been doing this for, you said, I think 10 generations. Well, I think that sense of community is one of the overarching characteristics of our farming community. I mean, I think folks are all pretty, try that better, back again. Sorry about that. I think we're all pretty aware of the fact that there's no, there's no one of us that that kind of exists off in the woods by ourselves. We rely on whether it's the infrastructure that exists because all of us are here or it's, you know, some, if heaven forbid something, something bad happens or some sort of, uh, you know, an inexplicable event or, or something like that happens with one of our dairy or agricultural families. I mean, I think farmers are the first ones to to rush to make sure that they're there to support and provide provide assistance. And a lot of times, I think farmers are able because they are a jack of all trades and and have lots of skills and lots of uh, resources that they're able to step right in and step right in and help. And I think that's a pretty pretty amazing thing about our community. And I think that's something that was that sense of community is something that we were all reminded of over the last year and a half. Yeah, and Saren, you've actually kind of developed a a different uh, sense of community, certainly on your own farm with a different enterprise, uh, helping people understand and get connected to that community. Tell us more about that. Are you alluding to my tiny house farmstead? Your tiny house, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, in 2019, uh, well, when I met Steve back in 2010, I was working on um, opening a hostel in Portland. And so not a farmer, a farmer by marriage. And I've accepted that I uh, can wear the title as well, uh, being a full-fledged on the farm, farm wife. Um, but manifesting dreams and bringing a tiny house um, into the fold of the farm buildings that we have around here and inviting people to come do stays on the farm where they're not expected to work. It's not like a woofing thing, but um, a free farm tour is included with for anybody who wants to, to take it. Heck, we'll give farm tours to the community too. It's not just for tiny house guests, but to see our farm through outsiders' eyes and to the education that happens and the realization of how removed people are and have no idea how vegetables grow, let alone how meat is grown, how pasture-based, like what's the difference between how we farm and how the meat in the grocery store that they might be used to getting or how what they get in a fast food restaurant, like that you buy a pound of burger in our store, it is one one beef, one animal in that pound. There, there's no more than one. I can guarantee there's one animal in that pound of pound of burger. And that's just like mind blowing in the bring it all down. Um, it's been wonderful for us to, to um, in the midst, I mean, it's July, it's high season. I can't believe any of us are here right now. Maybe because it's raining, we all can be <laughs> and are sort of cheering that we get the chance to be. Um, But amidst the crazy that is especially summer season in Maine, although with a dairy and with animals, it's year round for many farmers, um, it's nice to take a breath and be able to see the bigger picture of the farm and of 
of the romanticism that everybody says, oh, farming is so wonderful. I want to be a farmer. Mm -hmm, sure you do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so anyway, the tiny house, the Crow's Nest tiny house has been a great addition, a very successful um, side, side business as most Mainers have many hustles to make ends meet. Um, and um, it's been wonderful to share the farm with the wider world and have the wider world come here and expose my tiny girls who, who knows where they are now. Um, upstairs, they'll give farm tours with me. They're very proficient at it at four years old and seven year old, seven years old. It's very fun to watch them um, sharpen their teeth on, on saying all the same things mom does. I'm like, ooh, maybe I should rephrase that <laughs> when I hear it come out of their mouths. <laughs> it's fun. That's a great um, testament to more community experiences. Kina, I, I think, you know, you, you started us off telling us really like this is what, um, you know, a lot of your business model is centered around the word community. Um, what's, what's the take from your customers who are, who are buying and subscribing to your community supported agriculture enterprise? Yeah, I've had my CSA for 12 years now, and I have some customers that have been customers the whole 12 years. Um, I've had a really good retention rate, um, and the majority of my customers live within a 10-mile radius. So it's, um, it's definitely a testament to people, you know, really buying local or finding, finding local food. And I don't necessarily live, I don't live in an affluent community, um, but people are putting priority on buying fresh vegetables and, uh, and we happen to be organic too, but the price point is such that it is, it is affordable as long as you, you know, prioritize it. So so that's been pretty exciting to just to, to know that it's it's a lot of my neighbors that are that have joined and stayed with the CSA. It's been really fun to see their kids um, be born and um, and grow up on the farm and play with um, the dog or the ducks or pick berries or pick flowers and and then all of a sudden start driving their parents to the to the farm to pick up their share. So, um, yeah, so I've met a lot of the community that way and I'm, I'm very grateful. In fact, actually right now my, um, my tractor broke this past weekend and I put it out to the CSA and I had a very generous, um, CSA member. Uh, he's, uh, he loaned me his tractor. So I have another tractor that's uh, way more high class than my general farm tractor, but it's um, so yeah, in this hot, humid weather, I've even had AC It's pretty, <laughs> pretty plush, but, um, but I'm just so grateful that people are willing to trust me and, and loan their tractor out when I'm in a pinch um, because we, you know, we're at the last stretch of the summer here to get, get vegetables in the ground before, so they can grow before the fall. That's awesome. And um, you know, we'll continue to go around the horn, I guess. But um, Betsy, I, I think we've had this concept about, you know, and Kina touched base on it a little bit about, you know, food access and being able to find something that's from Maine and that can be local. And you talked about this at the very beginning, you know, you're, you do have value added uh, products in the custard, but you're also providing food year round in, in milk and whatever products, um, you know, come from milk that your cows might provide. So if somebody's looking for that, um, how, do, how do they find that if, if you, you don't, you don't have a CSA per se, but what's a tip for, for shoppers or people who might want to be shopping for others? Better, better without the mute. That's always that's always a good start. Uh, so fluid milk is 
pretty regularly going to be very local. If you want to look at specifics on your container of milk that you're looking at, there's a there'll be a code stamped on all on all milk milk products that's so sold, and there'll be a number, a dash, and another number. The, that first number, if it's 23, that means it was packaged here in the state of Maine, and that's that's pretty exciting to see. Hey, you know what? That it's entirely possible that that milk was produced just down the road from me, which is which is definitely when we when we want to be honest about some of the environmental impacts of some of our food systems. If it was produced close by, probably a decent chance that you're having a, a less deleterious impact than than if it than if it hadn't been. So that's that's a great way. I mean, certainly as as we think about the last 10 or 15 years, there are lots more, whether they're farmers markets per se, or they're farms that have elected to go the route of marketing direct to the consumers. So there are lots more options there, I think, than there were historically. And, and maybe it's just that we're more aware of them and we're having a little bit more robust conversation about, hey, you know what, that those greens that we ate last week are, are where did you find those? Was that something local or, you know, when, Talk to your talk to your friends and your neighbors, and what what have you had for food that was? I mean, food features in a lot of our conversations because I, we like it, and and I like the comment earlier about we may not be as farmers we may not be a high income sort of profession, but gosh, we we do eat pretty well, and and it's a pretty big part of our lives, and and we enjoy it, or we wouldn't, you know, or we wouldn't continue to do that. So I think sharing that. Uh, regard for the products that we're producing and consuming at the same time, that's infectious. I mean, I, I'm with Kina. I have enjoyed tremendously with the custard shop having neighbors come in and, and end up becoming repeat customers that maybe the grape nut recipe is, you know, I haven't had grape nuts since my, you know, great aunt Ethel or, or you know, something like that, that had a, had a recipe that we always used to have on Sunday dinner or something like that. But so that's creates some additional intersection points that uh, just because you're buying it at the grocery store doesn't mean it isn't local. I mean, always remember that there's lots of local foods and it, that are available in our, our usual modes of, of buying food, but there are also all these other ways to buy local. I think we're very fortunate in Maine that we also have had a pretty robust uh, restaurant and food service scene that has placed tremendous value on local ingredients and, and those unique characteristics that local local foods do have. So I think it's a great place to be producing food and eating food. And yeah, can you tell us more about like your experiences with restaurant? I'll, I'll start with you, Betsy, um, your relationship to local restaurants or um, food producers or beverage producers in the state. Yeah, so we have both on the from the standpoint of being a consumer uh, and dealing with some more food service type folks, for example, we elected to add coffee to our ice cream shop. And we figured that we were committed to making a really high quality uh, ice cream, frozen custard product, and it would be just a tragedy really to pair it with something less than less than fantastic. So we, we uh, spoke with the folks at uh, Coffee by Design and learned about coffee and, you know, had the opportunity to, to talk with other folks who are really passionate about the food item that they, that they work with. So that was, that was great to see some synergies there as we have, uh, you know, some small eateries, whether it's like with a golf course locally or something like that. Again, that's where we see some of those folks placing value on locally sourced and, and locally made. And, and that's a lot of fun to talk about. So what's your feature flavor going to be this month? I mean, is it lemon custard with a blueberry cobbler or is it, you know, we're going to do uh, something that involves maple or, or something seasonal like that. And, and we're small enough that we have the ability to, to customize some things and, and to work with that. So that's a, that's a fun process. And um, is that local connection? So we're talking about human food, but do the cows also get some some local food too? So the cows are amazing. Like their superpower literally is that they can take food items or discarded food items that would be headed to a landfill someplace 
and turn it into milk. They, so they have giant onboard fermentation vats. So they can take things like the spent grains uh, from beer production. Like we get brewer's grains, spent grains from Allagash Brewery, so our cows eat as much of that as, as uh, we can pair with the other locally grown things like grass and, and uh, corn silage uh, that they eat. We feed whey that would be, that's a byproduct of uh, yogurt making. So again, these are things that would go to a landfill otherwise or be disposed of some other ways and our animals are capable of turning them into high quality protein that, that people can make the most of. So that's that's a lot of fun. I've been in other parts of the country where that are, I think, larger veg crop growers than we are necessarily right here with us and everything from cull sweet corn to cull beets. To, and I will say that encountering a large number of animals that have been munching on cull beets is a little bit disconcerting. Not quite sure what's what's going on with the red frothing at the mouth kind of thing, but they can they can turn those beets into high quality milk or meat just as easily as they can the things that we think of as commercially packaged grains or things like that too. So a lot of recycling happening to keep it local um, in ways that we we don't always think about it. Um, We're, we're kind of coming to the end of the hour here and um, we know it's just about supper time for Saren and her family, but there's a like one last question that I love to ask um, all of you, which is like in a, in one sentence or or more, and Sarah, I'm going to uh, turn this over to you. If if you could tell people about why it matters and and what the value is to supporting local agriculture, um, what would you like to tell them? Um, keeping your dollar right here, keeping your dollar right in your community, because when my neighbors buy from me, I then go and support other local products. I support other local businesses and that dollar just keeps circulating right here. Um, and that makes a difference in our main economy as, as well as um, just making Maine a stronger place. So, yeah. Here's Thank dinner. you. Here's the <laughs> we got a, a delicious looking all, far, uh, all farm dinner. Yeah, sweet corn and some chicken. Um, Kina, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you and uh, give you a you know a word that you could share or you know a sentence or two about why it really matters to support agriculture in Maine and um, and farms. Yeah, there are so many good reasons to support agriculture and farms. And I think, yes, I would encourage people to continue to open their minds to, to um, prioritizing their dollar on local food. And, and I think that they'll be happily surprised to realize that it's not as uh, expensive as they think it is, or not as accessible as they might think it is. And yeah, and I would also just encourage people to continue to educate themselves, listen to podcasts like these, and to understand like we all were nodding our head in agreement that we all have our processing dates for our animals set up a year and a half in advance, because there aren't enough processors. And that's starting to be a a real big deal. And there have been processing places that have wanted to open, but communities are shutting them. They, they advocate that they don't want them in their backyard. So I think it would be really good to just educate yourself on what the processing facilities look like here in Maine. They just look like farms. They don't smell. Um, they treat their animals really well. They're kept clean. And, um, and we as growers need those facilities so that then we can continue to continue our livelihood, but also continue to provide really um, incredible food for you, the consumer. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, Betsy, we'll, we'll finish with you. Um, any final thoughts about why it matters um, to keep supporting farms for hopefully uh, future generations of Mainers and farmers? 
I agree wholeheartedly with both Saren and Kina's, Kina's comments. Absolutely keeps the money local and absolutely has a huge impact on what our local communities look like. When we think about that enigmatic quality of place that Maine has that folks talk about, like I can't really quantify it. Well, a lot of it has to do with a robust farming landscape in this in the state. And I, and I would agree, I would encourage folks to ask questions, find a farmer and ask him a question or, or find Anne and ask her a question. If you're curious, if I bought this in the grocery store, was it local or I bought this at the farmer's market or do you know of another farmer's market? Just ask. I mean, there are more than farmers as a, as a whole are, may appear a bit gruff occasionally, especially if it's daylight savings day or something fun like that, but more than happy to share their share their wisdom and to and to tell you what what a day in the life on a farm looks like and seek that out it can be a lot of fun and and definitely uh, your kiddos if they come out to the farm for a visit that i can guarantee that they'll have fun stories uh, so sarah we'll let you get off to uh, supper time but any closing thoughts for you um I, especially in this last year and a half of pandemic, I have really enjoyed being connected to my farming community through Instagram and through social media. Um, yeah, we're on social media, follow us if you want, but I love following other farms. Like my feed is just other farms to see what other people are doing. I get great ideas. I ask questions. I, and I mean, it's a pretty easy, way to connect so um as a as a starter as a starter method search search for farms around you and see if they have a social media presence that you can get a little a little taste of and see whether oh open farm day they're doing open farm day i could go and check it out you know whatever that means um they have store hours i could go to the store hours um yeah i could join the csa i could go get a scoop that's great. I really appreciate all four of you taking time to, you know, it is busy. And I just want to reiterate to our listeners, we had this uh, session in the height of summer. It's a really busy time of year. And if you're not from Maine, uh, you know, this is this is primo daylight hours. And although all these folks raise livestock, they also do a lot of other things in agriculture. Um, so thanks to all of all three of you for um, for taking time with us uh, this evening. And um, we're going to get ready to roll our credits. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Harvesting Maine is brought to you by the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. You can find farms and farm products at realmaine.com.